thank you all and good evening. Um, it's good to be back here for week number four of our journey together from hungry ghost to being human, uh, hopefully without going through hell or too many hells. I'd like to start this week uh, with one of uh, a, a talk by the Buddha, a very old talk by the Buddha as well. There are all the Buddha's talks are old, but this this one's con considered to be um, in one of the earliest collections um, of the Buddha's talks. It's actually in the little Hungry Ghost booklet that you may or may not have downloaded from um, the internet. Uh, it's on page number twenty, and it's the Buddha's words on kindness, on universal friendliness. The Buddha says, for one who is skilled in working out their own well-being and who wishes to attain that state of perfect peace should act thus. They should be able, honest and upright, gentle in speech, humble, not proud. They should be contented, easily supportable, not overly busy and simple in living. They should be controlled in their senses, serene, prudent, courteous and enjoy solitude. Also, they must refrain from any action which the wise would find fault. Let them cultivate these thoughts. May all be well, happy and peaceful. Whatever living beings they may be, without exception, weak or strong, short or tall, small, middle-sized or large, visible or invisible, those living near or far, born or yet to be born, may all beings be well, happy and peaceful. Let no one deceive nor despise another in any way. Let no one wish harm on another in anger or frustration. Just as a mother would protect her only child with her life, even so, let one cultivate un unconditional boundless friendliness towards all beings. Let them radiate boundless friendliness towards the entire world, above, below, and all across, unrestricted, with compassion for all. Whether standing, walking, sitting or lying down, as long as, are, as long as they are awake, let them develop this mindfulness. This, they say, is noble living here and now. That's a very beautiful, short um, talk, um, emphasizing this unconditional, um, boundless quality of of warm-heartedness, of goodwill, friendliness, uh, traditionally translated as loving kindness. But loving kindness doesn't come on its own, it comes with some counterparts. And one of those counterparts is, um, is mudita, is appreciative joy or joy gladness. Um, one of my teachers, John Peacock, translated uh, a Sri Lankan blessing verse, um, which goes, goes like this, well, well I'd better explain, put it into context. When the monks in Sri Lanka put on their full robes and, um, and walk barefooted with their arms bowls in the morning um, for, for their daily arms, um, as the villagers would put something in their bowl, bowls, these Sri Lankan monks would offer a blessing. And over centuries, they built up a catalogue of these, of these blessings um, that they offer uh, on receipt of, of dana, on receipt of someone putting something in a bowl. bowl. And so one of these blessings goes like this. And I'm going to offer it here to you tonight and to anyone uh, watching this um, video in the future. It goes like this. How wonderful you are in your being. I delight that you are here. I take joy in your good fortune. May your happiness continue and increase. It's a wonderful intention, a wonderful um, blessing to receive. It's a wonderful blessing to offer. But one of my one of my other teachers, Christina Feldman, who I'll probably mention a few times tonight because she's been so influential influential uh, to me uh, in terms of the Brahma Viharas. But Christina, she takes that verse and she, and she turns it inward. She turns it back on ourselves. So perhaps now. You'd do that for me. You'd, you'd put your hand on your, your heart, on your chest, wherever you think your heart is, and you'd recite the, the, 
the verse after me. How wonderful I am in my being. I delight that I am here. I take joy in my good fortune. And may my happiness continue and increase. Hugely powerful. Okay, I think it's time for us to, uh, to meditate. And we're going to uh, have a, um, a loving kindness meditation, a meta meditation. So if you, if it's your custom to turn your video off, please do. And if you want, if you don't want to turn it off, that's fine as well. But I'm going to put on a shared screen in a moment. So we take an upright, dignified posture. A posture that represents your heart's desire to awaken. A posture that represents your heart's desire to move away from suffering, to move towards the end of suffering. So as best we can, in whatever uh, environment we have, we sit upright, dignified, posture that represents awakening but equally it's it's a relaxed comfortable easeful posture we might let our eyes gently close let our face be soft and allow our jaw to relax let our shoulders drop back Quite naturally to open up the heart area. And allow our arms and our hands to rest easily. And feel yourself grounded, supported. Come aware of the points of contact with your cushion or your chair or feet touching the floor and feel yourself grounded and supported. And for this meditation, it can be very helpful to imagine that you're breathing in and out through your heart. Wherever it is in your chest that you imagine your heart to be, you might take a very deep breath in through that place. and a very long, slow breath out. And again, and a very deep breath in through the heart. And a very long, slow breath out. And then we just let the breath, breath settle down naturally. And just an awareness of the breath passing in and out through the heart. I'm going to offer you some, a mixture of phrases that are intended to cultivate a sense of well-being, a sense of friendliness, a sense of loving kindness. Some of the phrases are traditional, and one of the phrases, the last phrase, is a bit more meaningful, a bit more uh, directive. But feel free to keep reciting the phrases that resonate with you and if necessary drop any phrases 
that don't work for you. So we whisper these phrases silently at the back of our mind. May I be safe from inner and outer danger. May I be well in body and in mind. May I be happy and free from all distress. May I love myself just as I am right now. Just take a moment to check in with your heart center. And is there a softening? Is there a spaciousness? Is there an acceptance of these, these intentions, these aspirations, these wishes? Or is there a blockage, resistance, a contraction? around these phrases. But whatever you find in your heart, we just bring more kindness, more compassion. And if we're really struggling to wish ourselves well and good intentions, then maybe we need to bring a little bit of forgiveness to ourselves as well. May I be safe from inner and outer dangers. May I be well in body and in mind. May I be happy and free from all distress. May I love myself just as I am right now. May I be safe, may I be well, may I be happy, may I love myself just as I am right now. If your mind wanders, which inevitably it will, as soon as we notice that the mind has wandered, we just smile to ourselves. Take some pleasure in knowing that we're being mindful. We've noticed that we've lost the breath, we've lost our phrases, we've lost, our attention has wandered. So as soon as we notice our attention has wandered, we smile and very friendly, non-judgmentally, we return our full attention, our full intention 
to reciting these phrases. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be happy. May I love myself just as I am right now. As we continue to breathe in and out through our heart center, we bring these kind wishes to ourselves, these friendly intentions. We're befriending ourselves. May I be safe. May I be well. May I be happy. May I love myself just as I am right now.
No, thank you and good evening. Um, I find that practice uh, hugely transformative, even after 20 years of doing it. Um, it's still such a powerful practice. Um, when I, my path into, my route into this path, into the Buddhist path, the path of the Buddhist teachings was through my own addiction, through my own alcoholism and, uh, and stopping that addiction and finding myself lost and adrift and confused. Um, and not sure where to go and having a leaning towards uh, Eastern philosophies. Um, so perhaps we're going back 21 years, maybe slightly more now. Uh, and my wife at the time bought me two books. One, the first book was um, uh, a basic introduction to Buddhism, which just one thing in this stood out Im immediately which was a little less list of five suggestions on how to live your life um, harmlessly and we talked about those five suggestions last week uh, first suggestion being uh, not to harm anyone second suggestion being not to steal anything the third suggestion being to be sexually responsible the fourth suggestion being uh, to try and tell the truth and speak kindly and then the fifth suggestion was don't take drugs and alcohol um, because they lead to suffering. And up until that point, and I thought anyone who didn't take drugs and alcohol was completely and utterly mad. Um, but here I was being presented with this Eastern philosophy that, that said that one of their recommendations was, um, you know, don't take drugs and alcohol. And, and they all seemed to be quite happy and they weren't taking drugs and alcohol. So I found that hugely inspiring and supportive in my, in my early sobriety. Um, the other thing that was the other book that um, that my wife at that time gave me was Jack Caulfield's book um, A Path of Heart. Um, and, you know, like most people who, who, who give up um, a substance abuse or any destructive uh, addiction, um, you know, we're full of self-loathing, we're full of self-hatred, um, unforgiveness. Uh, and I was no different. So I, I, but I started reading Jack Cornfield's book and sh shortly into the book, there's a chapter on loving kindness or metta practice, loving kindness. Loving kindness isn't a great translation of the Pali word metta. But I'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, but here was this whole chapter on loving kindness. And at the end of the chapter, there was um, a, a written meditation, which effectively went, you know, um, recite to yourself may i be safe may i be well may i be happy um, and the instructions were to to offer this meta to yourself offer this loving kindness to yourself for you know weeks months or even years until you really got it before, and before you should um excuse me before you should offer it to anyone else and this is totally alien to me you know uh, an irish catholic um you know you did not offer yourself love you did not offer yourself friendliness you know that you were sure to be condemned to hell for that um so it's wonderful it's so transformative um and the whole practice not just of the loving kindness but the the other um, parts of, of these heart practices which i've i've come to know and love over the last 21 odd years um so the 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 encouragement the invitation to bring self-love and self-compassion and self-joy appreciation uh, for, for the way we're help leading our life and their intentions and self-balance so that we're not knocked off center uh, because um, relapse to whatever our compulsion or addiction was would not be a good thing and so these heart practices are just so important uh, they were then and they still are now Uh, now, a lot of um, emphasis is placed on um, uh, sometimes overly on, on this uh, foundational practice of loving kindness or um, universal friendliness or warm heartedness. 
uh, and sometimes the other um, components of these of this practice are, are almost forgotten the the component of compassion the component of um, of joy and the component of, of equanimity but they do come as a set and they all support each other and in they're they're often presented as heavenly places to dwell divine abodes um, they're known as the brahma viharas the home of the gods uh, places heavenly dwelling places and um, so we're going to take a, a bus stop tour through all four of them tonight um, uh, perhaps as, as a group together and then individually um, and this is from um, writing's too small for me from um, a 13th century I think um, a Tibetan monk and he says that out of the soil of friendliness grows the beautiful bloom of compassion watered with tears of joy under the cool shade of the tree of equanimity which is a lovely way to present these four qualities what are sometimes called the four faces of love or the four qualities of love or true qualities of love it might seem strange that uh, to anyone new to these practices that we should offer ourselves friendliness and compassion and joy and, and self-balance uh, before we we um, extend those out to anyone else but as was rather wonderfully put to me last year at a day retreat someone said to me of course it's obvious you you put on your own oxygen mask first because if you can't put your own oxygen mask on first, you can't help anyone else. A quote from Christina Feldman, one of my teachers, Christina Feldman, who's, who has incidentally written a, a number of books on the Brahma Viharas, on these qualities, and, and one book in particular um, on compassion uh, alone. But in this sense, uh, Christina says, some people carrying long histories of a lack of self-worth or denial find it difficult to extend compassion towards themselves. Aware of the vast suffering in the world, they may feel that it's self-indulgent to care for their own aching body, broken heart or confused mind. Yet this too is suffering. And genuine compassion makes no distinction between self and other. This group of four practices, which are said to be, uh, again, uh, rather like the rather like the precepts, rather like the wheel of becoming, that they predate um, uh, the Buddha. They predate two thousand six hundred years ago, and the Buddha just takes takes these ideas and um, presents them in a way that he finds helpful. So these immeasurable qualities, boundless qualities, unconditional, unconditional friendliness, compassion, gladness and joy, and contentment and equanimity. They're considered, when we cultivate these qualities, when we apply in our mind and heart towards these qualities, they're considered divine abodes, supreme abodes, sublime abodes. They're sometimes referred to as the four immeasurables, four boundless qualities of the heart mind, which when we develop them, they dissolve the separateness between self and other. Sometimes referred to as the four attitudes of love. But the Brahma Viharas are simple. They're a basic human warmth in all our relationships and indeed in all our experiences and when we cultivate these qualities they become our home and time and time again throughout the buddhist scriptures through the throughout the early um buddhist texts the buddha 
uh, returns to this theme of these four qualities and encourages us to incline our minds, to incline our heart, north, south, east, west, above, below, and all across, with loving kindness, with compassion, joy, gladness, and with equanimity. And, and he, he, he goes over this again and again and again, uh, both as a practice um, for lay people and for a practice for monks and nuns, for monastics. They're said to be, that when practiced, the complete path to combat greed, hatred, and delusion. And that um, loving kindness, compassion, and joy, gladness are all forms of mindfulness. And in, in one sense, uh, loving kindness is considered the finest of mindfulnesses. Because in, in, I'm aware that in the Tibetan tradition or the Mahayana tradition, the, the foundational quality, the foundational immeasurable quality, uh, it tends to be compassion. Um, but in the tradition I'm most closely aligned to, the Theravada tradition, uh, the founding foundational quality is metta, is, is loving kindness. Wishing goodness, happiness, and friendliness to all. When, when loving kindness experiences someone who's in pain or who's suffering, it transforms into compassion. It transforms into, may you be free of suffering. And when loving kindness encounters someone who is well and happy and successful, it transforms into joy, to an appreciative joy, into a mutual joy gladness. We rejoice in taking delight in the happiness and good fortune of others, as in a blessing that we offered ourselves at the beginning of tonight's talk. So we might say, may your happiness and success continue. And when loving kindness encounters suffering and pain that is beyond our control, it transforms it to equanimity. We might say, may you be open and balanced with conditions just as they are. Pardon me. Gil Fronstall, the American insight teacher, emphasizes that the Brahma Viharas are an expression of our basic human warmth. The love born of all the Brahma Viharas, <coughs> excuse me, is unconditional. It does, is, there's no, I will, I will love you if. The, the goodwill and the intentions behind the Brahma Viharas is unconditional. Unbounded without exceptions. They apply to everyone. So we can't say, I, I wish um, everyone be free of pain except so and so so and so it doesn't work we have to include everyone yeah, completely inclusive our goodwill our warm heartiness compassion our equanimity is, is given with no need and no expectation of anything in return and we give it without without grasping or clinging Christina Feldman, um, as I say, has greatly influenced me over the years with her writing and as a teacher. Um, and she makes the point uh, that over her, I think she's been teaching 40, 45 years or so. She's a um, teacher at Guy House in England. She teaches all over the world, but Guy House in England and for Bodhi College. She said the most striking thing she sees over the course of a retreat, over the course of someone's practice, is the move from aversion 
to kindness. A, sh a shift in someone's attitude from aversion to kindness, from self-hatred to self-acceptance. So the Brahm Vihara as, as a collection are, are a, a, you know, a mindful willingness to be close to yourself, a willingness to give yourself time, give yourself space, to be connected with yourself, the willingness to be here with the person you are most intimate with, yourself. The first of these qualities, these true faces of love, the first attitude that we might cultivate is this attitude of metta, of, I say, sometimes translate, or, often, or most often translated as loving kindness, uh, but might be better translated as love and kindness, or universal friendliness, or warm heartedness. Um, and the, the, sometimes the, the Pali words, the, the Buddhist words, are, are, are describe uh, these intentions, um, these concepts, uh, better than, than any English translation. And metta itself is, is, uh, has a root meaning of, of to befriend. Uh, it also has a, a sense of, of expanding, of, of, one might say, growing fat with happiness. Um, and I, I find that's very pleasing to think of growing fat with happiness. Um, so metta, a boundless friendliness, a kindness, an unconditional friendliness, a welcome, warm, kind and caring friendliness. It's standing close to ourselves, standing close to our experiences with boundless friendliness, boundless kindness. Mindfulness, sati, this um, practice of mindfulness, of keeping, in, keeping something in mind, of, um, of not forgetting, is bound up with all of these qualities and, and particularly bound up with, um, with loving kindness, it goes hand in hand. As I said last week, you know, mindfulness cares. Mindfulness isn't ethically neutral. Mindfulness is always in the service of re re relieving suffering, reducing suffering. So mindfulness and the Brahma Viharas go hand in hand. But let's be realistic. You know, we can't love all things. We can't love all beings. But we can set the intention at least to be kind and friendly. Uh, one of my other teachers, John Peacock, uh, he says, stop feeling with the head and start thinking with the heart. And if I can remember it right, there's a Van Morrison song that goes along the lines of, um, if my heart could do my thinking and my head begin to feel, I would look upon the world and know, and know what's truly real. That's a wonderful expression of, Meta of the Brahma Viharas. So, Meta or loving kindness is the antidote to ill will. It undoes the underlying attitude, uh, underlying attitude, and, and turns the tide against ill will. We incline our mind to kindness in order to dispense your will. And as, as the poem from uh, Long Chen um, we saw earlier says, after the soil of friendliness grows the beautiful bloom of compassion, watered by tears of joy, gladness, and sheltered beneath the cool shade of the tree of equanimity.
in terms of loving kindness or universal friendliness, the Buddha says that there is no finer mindfulness. And this practice is, is uh, repeatedly mentioned throughout all the Buddha's 45 years of teaching. So out of, out of kindness, out of friendliness, comes compassion. Um, and there are two uh, uh, Buddhist words uh, that are closely linked to compassion. Um, one of them is karuna. Um, which has the same root uh, meaning or same root der derivation as karma, uh, action. Um, and the other word is, um, is anukampa. Anukampa has a sense of the quivering of the heart, to tremble along with, to resonate with, to cry out at hearing the cry of another. So these two qualities of compassion go together. In fact, the Buddha said it's, it's out of Anukampa that I teach. It's only out of compassion that I teach. So we have this resonate, resonating with someone's pain, someone's suffering. And this, to start with, it's our own pain and our own suffering. And then we, this is put into action in terms of karuna. So, so com our compassion has the, the quality of being able to stand next to someone's pain, to witness someone's pain without running away, without trying to fix that pain out of our own aversion to the pain, but to, do, but to fix it out of kindness, out of compassion, if it can be fixed at all. I can recall very clearly uh, when I was first introduced to loving kindness practice from Jack Cornfield's book all those years ago, 21 years ago. And I would have a set of phrases that I would recite every night when I went to bed. And two of those phrases were, may I find compassion for myself and may I find compassion for other people. I had no idea what compassion meant. I had an intellectual understanding that it would be beneficial to to gain some compassion but i had no idea what compassion was certainly had compassion for myself or some compassion for others this lovely um quality and presentation of, of this characteristic of, of compassion it is wonderful to, to in terms of self-compassion being human is difficult it's full of disappointments it's full of stress we get an awful lot of what we don't want and often not much of what we do want. It's not easy. So to have some compassion just for our own pain um, it is a very positive quality. Karuna or Anukampa, a compassion is a direct antidote to cruelty to indifference to ourselves and others. Compassion, in this sense, is an action. It's not a feeling. So why, wise effort is an expression of compassion, of karuna. To move towards karuna or compassion is to move away from wrong view. It's the willingness to stand near and to continue to stand near to unresolvable suffering.
We're not creating more pain out of pain. As John Peacock says, and I'm not sure whether it's a quote from Shanti Deva or not, but my teacher John Peacock says that it makes no sense to talk about your pain. It makes no sense to talk about my pain. It only makes sense to talk about pain. So we're not asked to feel compassionate. We're asked to be compassionate. It's an activity, not a feeling. The Dalai Lama says that if you want others to be happy, practice compassion. And if you want to be happy, practice compassion. This really is a whistle-stop tour through these qualities. The third of these qualities, the third face of love, the third characteristic of true love, is mudita. It's joy, gladness, rejoicing. Um, the Buddha taught, taught two things. He taught suffering, and equally he taught the end of suffering. That there can be much bliss and joy in our life. Um, and many of the practices uh, that uh, this path offers deliberately cultivate joy and gladness um, and contentedness. So this third quality to be, to be cultivated, to sow the seed and cultivate, mudita. And mudita is the direct antidote to envy, jealousy. So, we take delight, excuse me. Um, not only do we take delight at other people's good fortunes, their successes, their happiness, but first and foremost is a place for taking delight in our own success, our own happiness. as part of um, part of the practice of cultivating joy gladness for others and joy gladness for ourselves it is the is an attitude of, of gratitude uh, an appreciation of all the things we have in our life rather than all the things that we don't have in our life uh, the ability to take delight in what we have and who we are rather than suffer for who we think we want to be and what we, and what we don't have. It's appreciating the simple. It, it's the antidote to, this doc, to the doctrine of, of insufficiency, that, that, that there's not enough happiness to go around. It also places responsibility on ourselves to cultivate our own happiness. So we don't wake up in the morning and shout out to the world, make me happy. We get into the habit of not always looking for what's wrong, but actually noticing what's right in our lives. The last Brahma Vihara, whereas the first three might be considered to be warm, warming, the fourth one is considered to be cooling, so it stops the other three. Um, getting out of control as it were. It keeps everything in check, it holds everything together. And the last quality, the last true face of love, quality of love, is equanimity. Um, the Buddhist word is upeka, <coughs> excuse me, or upeka in Pali or upeksa in Sanskrit. 
And upeka means to be in the middle, to be equally near or equally far from all things. It means to have balance, to be fully in the middle of the way things are, being centered with what is. Equanimity gives perspective. It lets us see clearly. There are no exclusions. Everything is included. With equanimity, there's a genuine willingness to avoid extremes. To stand still in the middle, in the midst of the extremes of our life and the extremes of our mind. Not to be driven by craving or aversion. But equanimity is not indifferent. Equanimity cares, but it cares in a non reactive way, as opposed to indifference, which simply doesn't care. Equanimity is infused through the other three factors of love, qualities of love. It's infused with kindness, it's infused with compassion, and it's infused with joy. It brings us stability and stops us getting knocked off center. And if you're in early recovery from a, uh, a compulsion or a, a substance addiction or any other type of addiction, maintaining this balance, no matter what happens in, in our life, um, can be life-saving, can mean the difference between life and death. John Peacock, um, again, translated another Sri Lankan verse, uh, a blessing verse that the monks offer, on their arms round. It goes like this. This life is but a play of joy and sorrow. May we re remain undisturbed by life's rise and fall. I care deeply for you, but you are the owner of your actions and their fruit. And sadly, I cannot keep you from distress. So there's an acknowledgement there that people are the owners of the results of their own actions and we can love and pray and have good wishes for people but at the end of the day it's their actions and that's out of our control so equanimity um, has that sense of, of just acknowledging that um, so there's a, an analogy, which I should probably get very wrong, that loving kindness is a little bit like having a, an infant child where you, where you do hold and protect that child. You care for that child, you're friendly to that child. Compassion is, is like that slightly older child who scrapes their knee. Uh, so we, we, we bring compassion and, and see what we can do to, to help their injuries. Um, and then mudita is for the older child still who perhaps goes off to school or university and we take great joy in their success and their, and their happiness. And then when our, when our children are older and married on, of themselves, um, you know, then we have equanimity for them. We let them make their own choices, live their own life. Martin Batchelor, um, uh, says of equanimity that it's a creative acceptance. Uh, Arjun Sumedho, um, the American Thai forest uh, tradition teacher, um, he refer he he uh, uses the phrase "right now it's like this," just bringing an equanimity to how things are in this moment. I'm conscious of time and, it, and, and, and conscious of the fact that these are huge, huge subjects. Uh, we go through these, um, these four uh, qualities on a five day retreat and, and even then we just scrape the surface. So I don't know where I've done the, these four qualities any, um, 
uh, any justice in, in this brief time. Uh, but I hope that it's given you an introduction and perhaps an interest um, in, in these, um, the possibilities uh, that, that the cultivating uh, these qualities uh, might bring. And from a Buddhist perspective, you know, they're, they're just so encouraged. They, they, if I were to say, you know, if, someone's, if someone asked me, what is your path? Well, my path is the Brahma Viharas, the heart practices. I want to live from the heart. Um, because they, they are the way out of greed, hatred and delusion. Um, the, from my perspective, they are how I want to live my life. Um, I'm aware now that it's it's half past uh, eight. We have time for questions and answers. If anyone would like to either type a question in the chat box, which this week I hope I can see, or if anyone would like to unmute your microphone and ask a question live, that's okay as well. Hi, my name hey, Vince. Uh, Hi, yeah. who's that? Kenny in Tampa, or uh, Anna Maria. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi, yeah. Hi, man. I just wanted to show you the shirt I was wearing. I, 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 I can't actually see, see. I can't see it, Kenny. Because oh, it's the, it's the the Samoto, uh Right now, uh, it's like this. Yeah, right now, it's like this. Yeah, I've been wearing it all day. It's weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's all. Thank yeah. you. I, I I can't actually see because my my camera's fixed. So um, but that's thank all right. you. For, Thank you for sharing that with us, Kenny. Thank you. It's cool. I am up. That, bring, that brings joy and happiness. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Thank you. I'll have a I'll have a little ramble then. Um, but I. Um, last year I taught a whole weekend retreat uh, entitled um, Living from the Heart and it was based around uh, a famous sutta, a famous talk that the Buddha gave to uh, some villagers um, I think the village was called Kasaputta and the villagers um, were known as the Kalamars and the Kalamars were very confused because teachers kept coming to through their village every week and denouncing the last lot of teachers and proclaiming that their teachings were the only true teachings. And they were very perturbed and disturbed and unsure. And when um, uh, the Buddha turned up with his retinue in the village, they approached him and said, oh, oh look, you know, we have people coming in here week after week claiming to telling us they're the one and only truth how are we supposed to know um, what's true and what's not true uh, and that's when the buddha said oh you know kalamars you're right to be perturbed you're right to be confused um, and then he he set a series of questions to them oh, you know does greed lead to suffering and, and um, uh, uh, unhappiness or does it lead to your benefit and welfare and they replied, you know, it leads to suffering. And he went through, you know, does, does hatred lead to suffering or, or, or happiness? Does delusion lead to suffering or happiness? And then it, and the Kalamars replied and he said, yeah, that's right. You know, so, so don't go on ancient tradition. Don't go something written down. Don't go on something because the teacher, you know, is, is charismatic. Don't go on something because you've, you've reasoned it out by logic. You know, just know, does, does this teaching, do these things lead to your benefit and welfare or do they lead to suffering and misery? And he asked them a whole series of questions. And then he kept reiterating at the end. You know, yeah, you're right. You're absolutely right. So, you know, don't go alone on the fact that something's ancient traditional. Don't go alone on the fact it's been written down for, you know, centuries. Don't go alone that um, it's been handed down generation to generation. Don't go alone that, that um, the teacher seems to know what he's talking about or this is logical. Just know that, you know, do these things lead to suffering or away from suffering? And that's part one of the sutta. And everyone knows that bit. But part two of the, this, this talk says, and once you've realized what leads to suffering and what, what leads away from suffering, then um, 
you should incline your mind in every direction with loving kindness. In fact, incline your heart. Uh, I think the translation I've got says heart. I, I haven't got my translation there, but he said um, you should um, incline your heart uh, uh, with loving kindness in every direction. Incline your heart with compassion in every direction. Incline your heart with joy, gladness in every direction. And incline your heart in every direction with equanimity. Um, and when he, when he refers to the first direction, second direction, third direction, fourth direction, it, what he means is we, we incline, we imbue um, every part of our life, everything in public and in private. Um, you know, even under the carpet, everything is imbued with these qualities. And then the Buddha offers, offers um, some guarantees, which he, he doesn't normally offer guarantees about this path, but at the end of this talk he does. He says, if you do these things, if you, if you know what moves you away from suffering, if you practice the heart practices, then I guarantee you, he, four things, but the first two things he said, you know, he says, I guarantee that if there is a life after this life, if there are future lives, then on your death and the breakup of your body, uh, you're guaranteed for rebirth in a happy place. Done, dusted. And he said, if uh, you practice these things, moving away from suffering, if you practice these heart practices, and on your death and the breakup of your body, it turns out that there are no future lives, it doesn't matter because you will have had your reward in this life. What a wonderful guarantee. So would anyone? Hi, uh, hiya. Hi, this is uh, Luke, um, also from Anna Maria, Florida. Um, thank you for sharing what you shared today. Um, it's a lot to take in. I'm, I'm newly, I'm newly into the Buddhist teachings, and we, we have a refuge recovery group, and um, I am also newly in recovery so i'm it's 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 uh well i'm newly in recovery now again let's say it that way but i uh i just had a question about equanimity like i, I have a hard time i think i understand the concept of equanimity but i have a hard time um still forgiving myself and not um i can i have a, don't have a hard time sending it sending it to others and knowing that their actions are of their own core. But with, with my actions, I keep going back into the guilt and shame of my actions. Mm -hmm. And I'm just looking for some words of encouragement on how to stay in the positive. Yeah. Well, the, the, you said it was Luke. Yeah. Yeah. Luke. Yeah. Yeah. Look, yeah thank, thanks for your question. Very important question. Um, the, uh, the abbot, the second abbot of Wat Tham Prabok in Thailand, this famous detox monastery, he used to say, um, actions do not die. Just that, actions do not die. So equanimity acknowledges that. Equanimity, you know, embraces karma, our actions and, and their fruits. And equanimity acknowledges that... Um, there's some things we have control over and often uh, some things other than other people we have no control over at all. Um, so there's this famous um, set of um, worldly winds, which I can, I can never remember the exact combination of. Um, the eight worldly wins, pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, success and failure. And we're all subject to them. They happen to us throughout our life. Pleasure and pain, gain and loss, praise and blame, success and, success and, and blame. Um, so equanimity is about 
not being bowled over either way, not being blown around by those worldly winds and maintaining a, a, a stable centre. Which, in, t in terms of, of um, forgiveness and our own actions, you know, we, ha we, we have to um, think about impermanence. Everything's impermanent. That was who I was. It's not who I am. It's not who I will be. So next week, we'll be looking uh, at, um, at forgiveness practice, actually looking at how we harm people, how other people have harmed us, and how we can um, recognise that uh, and cultivate remorse. Because guilt uh, is unhelpful. Guilt, guilt says, I was a bad person. I am a bad person. I'll always be a bad person. But remorse says, well, you know, that's who I was. It's not who I am, and it's not who I'm going to be. So there's a potential for change. We recognise our, our misdemeanours. We recognise our wrong actions. Our dark karma. Dark karma leads to dark results. Bright karma leads to bright results. So we recognise that, and we set this intention, well, yep, now I know that greed, hatred, and delusion, however they manifest in my life, lead to misery and, misery and pain, just like the Kalamars told the Buddha, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, greed, greed, hatred and delusion lead to, to misery and pain. But non-greed, non-hatred and wisdom lead to the end of suffering, lead to benefit and welfare. So we set that intention up. The mere fact that you're here tonight, Lou, there's an intentionality there. It's calming. There's a seed being sown already because you're here tonight. Thank so you. you're just encouraged to, to keep watering that seed, and, and and you know, and embrace impermanence. That's who I was. It's not who I am now. Not who I will be in the future. So this, and the lovely idea of not self, no fixed, controllable, unchanging self that the Buddha offers is also so liberating, because we're not bound by any past identities. We have to work very hard to cling on to past identity. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. So I hope I'm looking at the to see if there's any questions there. Look, I hope that helps. Um, and you know the um, the, this whole path is is designed in, in a very compassionate, kind, pragmatic, and practical way to move us away from suffering towards the end of suffering. And to do that out of compassion and not out of aversion. Not running away from pain out of aversion, but running, but moving away from pain out of compassion for being human. It's bloody difficult, disappointing, it's stressful. It's, um, oh, you know, birth, sickness, old age and death, pain, sorrow, grief, lamentation and despair. That's only on Monday. Thank you so my, much. I, my, my pleasure. Look, I can't, I need a bigger print on my screen. Yeah, yeah, Kenny's saying about the, a, a, lot, a lot of the teachings that are, are, have been about equanimity. And, you know, all of these teachings overlap. I, I refer to them as a jigsaw puzzle, but it's a jigsaw puzzle where the pieces all overlap. Um, and everything influences everything else. Karma influences um, equanimity. Equanimity influences karma. Um, and, you know, supported by kindness, joy, and, um, and compassion. Compassion is an expression of, um, of, you know, of the suffering, the natural suffering of life. But joy, you know, an expression of the potentiality and possibilities that we can experience, you know, contented happiness. Um, you know, nirvana isn't this far off distant place or some state we have to, we have to achieve. And you know, nirvana is here, right here now. The absence of greed, the absence of hatred, and the absence of confusion. And we can experience that today, here and now. It might be momentary, but
that the more moments of, of, of nirvana we build up, the more moments of equanimity we, we build up, um, you know, it comes together. There's a question here from, from Donald about, I suffer greatly from loss and loneliness and struggle and struggles to find it and struggle to find it. find love or for forgiveness for myself in these early days of recovery. Donald, you know, my heart goes out to you. You know, seriously, my first two years, 18 months to two years of recovery were miserable. I was, I was in a job I didn't want to do in a marriage that was, that, that was not, fulfilling my needs or my 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 wife's needs my ex-wife's needs um and i didn't know who i was where i was or, or what i was doing or where i was going it was miserable i if i thought i was having a nervous breakdown i probably was having a nervous breakdown so i understand uh how you feel uh not being not feeling worthy of forgiveness not feeling worthy of self-love it's very very hard but i you know I can only encourage you to you know, pick some of these practices that are there deliberately intended to cultivate kindness for yourself, to cultivate compassion for yourself, to cultivate joy for the, you know, for getting up in the morning and, um, and the kettle works or the coffee tastes good. Um, you know, to, to, to really incline your mind to, to shift out of, of any uh, old identities, any old ways of thinking, and literally to reprogram the way we think. We reprogram the way we see ourselves, the way we see the world, and the way we see ourselves in the world. And that's, that's why we keep, you know, we, we come back again and again to, pardon me, we come back again and again to, you know, what the mind frequently thinks and ponders becomes the inclination of the mind. And as I get, go back to Christina Feldman. You know, she says she rephrases that and says, you know, what the mind frequently thinks and ponders um, shapes the mind. The shape of your mind shapes your world, and that's why you know the Buddha goes back again. You know, to that's why you, you mentioned it so many times. You know, incline your mind in every direction, loving kindness. Incline your mind and your heart in every direction with compassion. Incline your heart, mind in every direction with joy. And that gladness, incline your mind in every direction with equanimity, this sense of balance. He, he, you know, he puts so much emphasis on, you know, change the way you think. Know what leads to suffering, know what leads away from suffering. And then change the way you think. Shape of your mind, shape of your heart will shape your world. There, I'm going to call uh, an end to questions because of the, the time we've got left. And I, I would like to get another short meditation in and end with a, a quotation um so if if everyone is okay we might straighten ourselves up and uh, i will share screens And I will So just to bring our evening here or our our session here today just to a close just bringing the brahm viharas into this closing meditation particularly equanimity a sense of being in the middle in the midst equally near and equally far So we sit upright, dignified, alert. 
a wakeful posture. Posture representing our heart's desire to awaken. And like the loving kindness meditation, we just recite these phrases silently like a whisper at the back of our mind. May I find stillness in the midst of chaos. May I be at ease in the midst of discomfort. May I be safe and well in the midst of uncertainty. May I live with kindness in the midst of all that is difficult. May I find stillness in the midst of chaos. May I be at ease in the midst of discomfort. May I be safe and well in the midst of uncertainty. May I live with kindness in the midst of all that is difficult. May I find stillness. May I be at ease. May I be safe and well. May I live with kindness. Now, one of the ways that I practice mindfulness, particularly in, in terms of mindfulness being something that we remember, mindfulness being something we, we don't forget, mindfulness being something that we recollect. Um, I have a morning prayer or a morning, morning aspiration or a morning recollection that I use every day. So I might wake up and I might check my phone. Um, but as soon as I get out of bed and put my feet on the floor, this recollection comes to mind. This is my aspiration for each and every day. May I remember to meet today with joy and appreciation. 
with friendliness and kindness, with generosity and compassion, and with understanding and acceptance. Maybe you could incorporate something similar into your own morning routine. Um, Oh, a final quote from Christina Feldman. She said, the path of compassion is cultivated one step and one moment at a time. Each of these steps lessens mountains of sorrow in the world. Well, we could, we could rephrase that. So the path of recovery is cultivated one step at a time, one step and one moment at a time. Each of these steps lessens mountains of sorrow in the world. Equally are valid. And lastly, you might remember the, the, the closing paragraph from the discourse on loving kindness that, that I read at the beginning. And I just rephrased it a little bit here. Whether I'm standing, whether I'm walking, whether I'm seated or lying down, as long as I'm awake, let me cultivate this mindfulness. This, they say, is divine abiding right here and now. So the practice of these Brahma Viharas, the practice of these four faces of love, there is no finer mindfulness. So that's the end of this evening. I just not want to mention that uh, next week we're going to look at forgiveness. Um, so next week's practice will be slightly different. We'll have a longer uh, meditation, a meditation uh, um, around forgiveness, around forgiveness through the lens of the five precepts. So you don't have to uh, because uh, forgiveness is mentioned in the little Hungry Ghost booklet. But if you wanted to print off the, the large forgiveness workbook, which is on the Fifth Precept website to be downloaded, you might find that useful to read in advance or use it as a, as a, uh, a workbook. Um, so I hope to see you next uh, Wednesday evening at 7.30 UK time. Uh, as always, uh, these teachings are offered uh, freely, open heart, unconditionally, open mind and open hands absolutely unconditionally, um, unbounded, without exception. Um, but if you'd like to contribute um, to, to Dana um, towards his teachings, towards uh, presenting these teachings, um, uh, you're very welcome to, and the details are on the Hungry Ghost uh, website, and I'll put the details uh, uh, on the YouTube video when it's published at the weekend. So. If you'd like to unmute your microphones as, as we do in previous weeks and say good night, you're very welcome to. Thank you very much for your practice. Thank you very much for your presence. And thank you very much for your patience. So I'm very grateful, uh, glad, and joyful that you've been here tonight. Thank you. I can see a few people waving. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, there we are. Thanks. See you next well, week. Thanks. Good week, everybody. Bye. 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 Oh, and don't forget to sit and chair meetings on Thursdays and Mondays. Thanks, Vince. Thank you very much.